All right, 476, it's time for induced pluripotent stem cells. So I'm gonna stand up today, pretend like I'm actually lecturing. So here we go, IPSCs, people, right? What, huh? Yes, human embryonic stem cells, that's the guy we've been talking about. We introduced the genetic basis of pluripotency, which has lots to do with Induced pluripotent stem cells, what are they? Those guys are when we take an adult cell, any old cell, and turn him back into stem cells that are pluripotent, can become almost anything in the body. <laughs> so, right, if you're an ES cell, a human ES cell, you come from an embryo. If you're an induced pluripotent stem cell, you can come from any type of cell. Yes, yes. All right, so the most famous <laughs> publications for induced pluripotent stem cells, the very first ones in 2006, making a pluripotent stem cell from a mouse, embryonic and adult fibroblast culture, using what? Transcription factors. And then a year later, being able to do this in humans. Who did this? Shinya Yamanaka, super famous because of this amazing discovery. Woohoo! What's the biggest prize in science? <laughs> the Nobel Prize. So he won that in 2012 jointly with John Gurdon. Huh. Together, their discovery of reprogramming to make pluripotent stem cells is groundbreaking. Yes, revolutionized understanding. Uh, development and specialization, right? Mature, mature cells is not combined to its forever specialized state, at least not in the lab. Physiologically, this has never been seen where in a, uh, an adult cell goes backwards, but definitely in the laboratory, we can make it happen. Textbooks have been rewritten, people. <laughs> Reprogramming human cells, we can create all kinds of opportunities for diagnosis and therapies of all different kinds of diseases, disorders, bad stuff. So who's this guy? Who's this John Gurdon guy? Whoa, 1962, the first guy to clone, right? He did it in frogs, took that enucleated egg cell stuck in the DNA from a mature uh, frog cell and got baby frogs. So he was the first guy to clone, the first one to show that you can take adult DNA and make it be able to do everything, right? That's the clone, right? It's an adult, it should be only, the genes should only be on for the tissue it came from. But when you take that nucleus out and you stick it in an embryo, that embryo reprograms that DNA so it can become anything again. So that was step one, so that's how, why he got the Nobel Prize with Yamanaka, who then took regular old cells from mice, stuck in a few genes, and could oh, turn the page backwards. Be able to, into all types of the cell body. What is that called? Pluripotency. So here he is, there's a bunch of information about him. I'm not gonna read it to you, you guys have the PDF if you're interested but uh, from Japan, also worked, um, did his postdoc in San Francisco, and so now he has affiliations at lots of different places and lots of different universities. So how do we create induced pluripotent cells? Again, we take some regular old mature cells, we treat with small molecules, <laughs> so generic. So we're gonna tell you which ones they are. They're transcription factors, the guys that turn on and off genes, which makes sense, right? If the whole point of reprogramming is taking a mature cell that only has a subset of genes turned on, shoving him backwards so that all the genes can come back on, surprise, transcription factors. And then we isolate cells that look like stem cells, and then we can grow and differentiate them into everything. So that's the whole create an iPS cell and then differentiate it. Right, that's step four here. So we'll get a little bit more of the nitty gritty about how that happens. And so for, oh, 
to step back just a second, the Nobel Prize. So here's the our little friend, the the frog guy. <laughs> so right, we take the an egg, right, and we take the nucleus out. We take a oh look at him, he's so cute. We take a little skin cell, we take that nucleus, stick it inside that egg cell that has no nucleus, right? That guy's missing DNA. And then, ooh, it acts like a zygote. Oh. Grows up, makes the little froggies. Yay, he's a clone. He's genetically identical to this guy. And then as we know, there's Dolly the sheep. We can do to mice, cows, pigs, and probably a whole lot more um, by now. This was back in 2012 when this was set up. So pretty much, <laughs> I think almost everything we've tried. So that is the stepping stones to reprogramming, the, the, the foundation that DNA can, change, can turn back time. And then of course, Yamanaka looked at genes that he could add to a regular old skin cell, make him turn back time to uh, embryonic-like cell, and then that cell could produce an entire mouse. Yes, yes. And then we can do it in humans too. Take a skin cell, add those transcription factors, get that embryonic like cell, <laughs> and then differentiate into all the different types. So we can do it for humans, mice, and again, Nobel Prize winning work. So what are the pluripotency factors? Pluripotency factors are four different transcription factors that give us that pluripotent state or allow cells to keep their stemness. <laughs> That's a nice word people use in the, um, in the field. Um, selected for expression of another factor, nanog, that's also a pluripotency marker. So if that's on, that's a sign that it is pluripotent, it is a stem cell. So they can be driven by forced expression of OCT4 alone. So originally it was these guys. Now we know if we give OCT4 to a neuronal stem cell. So what's that guy? Like a progenitor, he's multipotent, he's already on the way in the neuron pathway, then we don't need all of them. So if you're not going all the way back to the beginning, like an embryonic cell, you start with a progenitor, then you only need OCT4. So that suggests that OCT4 is the most important guy for <laughs> potency. All right, so, and then lots of other combinations have worked in different types of cells, and again, the more progenitor-like, the earlier you grab those adult stem cells, then the easier it is to actually reprogram back. So if you're fully differentiated, it takes all four to get back. If you're multipotent, it may only take one or two to get back. So that's what this is talking about. Um, there's some other things that, it, that have to do with histone deacetylases and DNA methylases. And remember from that last lecture, those guys are what keeps uh, DNA in heterochromatin, right? Heterochromatin is off, euchromatin is on. So if we get rid of DNA methylation and we add DNA acetylation, opens up those chromosomes and allows transcription to occur on more genes. That would allow things to be more stem-like. Things, DNA, cells. Oct4, oh. he's an octomer transcription factor, as it turns out, Octomers are my favorite transcription factors. And oh, here's my favorite motif. Oh, it's the octomer motif. It's my all time favorite. <laughs> it's only expressed in pluripotent stem cells. You're not going to find OCT4 being expressed in any differentiated cell. That being said, is the OCT4 gene in a differentiated cell? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it's not turned on, but it's there. It's turned off, heterochromatinized. Only time it's open and making its protein is in a pluripotent cell. Oh, it forms a complex with this friend SOX2 and uh, on DNA, right? Remember, transcription factors bind DNA. It's their job. 
turn up transcription usually. And just a little note, never, ever, ever any kind of IPSC in any combination of any of that other stuff works without OCT4. So, you know, somebody says, what is the most important transcription factor for pluripotency? What would you say OCT4? If somebody said, what is Dr. Malone's favorite transcription factor? Family, <laughs> you would say Octomer. <laughs> I love Oct1 and Oct2. I'm sorry, those are my two favorites. Oct2, probably a little more than Oct1, because Oct2 has a friend named Bob that he binds to, and then they activate or not. Check out the Octomers. I think you'll like them too. All right, SOX2. The SOX family of transcription factors are Dave Ballard's favorite transcription factor. So, you know, if you're having a little conversation with her, bring up SOX2, and oh my gosh, she'll be like so in. All right, another complex with OCT4 and our little Octomer sequence. Woo. So a motif, that's just a DNA sequence. So it's usually a consensus sequence where something binds to. That's all that means. Oh, SOX2, pluripotent, multipotent, unipotent. So we don't really talk about the unipotent. Unipotent are like the stem cell that are the ones right before that terminally differentiated cell like the guy in your uh, hair follicle in the skin cells. It can really just go to one type of cell. So when it splits, one stays, when it does mitosis, one stays a stem cell, the other becomes a terminally differentiated cell. That's all it can do. So it's not multipotent, it can only just make that one guy or stay itself. Okay, so if you are screwed up in SOX2, if you have mutations, bad stuff happens to you. Also, family, is associated with maintaining this pluripotency, so maintaining stemness, right? Multipotent and unipotent. Um, it's not necessary for IPSC induction if, again, you have these already multipotent stem cells that you're activating to go backwards. So SOX2 is good, we love him, of course, but OC4 is the guy. All right, what about KLF? It can act as an activator or a repressor by binding to this core sequence. So the sequence is a little bit outside, probably have to do with whether it's an activator or a repressor. It may have a co-activator, co-repressor protein that binds to it to make it work. Um, it binds multiple times on its own promoter and it can activate its own transcription. So that'd be like a positive feed loop. Oh my God. Okay, and it suppresses transcription of P53, which is a tumor suppressor. So tumor suppressors make mitosis go down. So if you turn that off, mitosis goes up. Like embryonic stem cells want to keep making more because you got to go from zygote to entire gazillion uh, cells in our body. Uh, okay. So thought is a required factor, but as it turns out, you can leave it out and use the other guys and we can still get that. Again, if we add that histone deacetylase inhibitor, which means we acetylate stuff, obviously things work better because if you're opening up that chromatin, helping out those transcription factors, boom, they can get in there. Again, don't need it for those neural progen progenitors, but again, we already said those guys are already halfway home <laughs> to being embryonic, so it's all good. It's all good, people. All right, what about C-Mix? C-Mix a good guy. C-Mix actually the uh, first um, oncogene ever discovered. Ooh, I'm, I'm pretty sure somebody got the Nobel Prize for that. Uh, <laughs> let's see, so needed it to do those mouse IPSCs except at the very beginning. Um, oh, now it only helps, it makes it a lot easier, but it's not absolutely necessary. So C-Mix a good guy, but you could leave them out and still be okay. If you have CMIC in there on the big four, it's way faster, it works so much better. But technically speaking, you don't absolutely have to have it. What else? Nanog, that's that little guy that they thought originally was absolutely required, but it's really not. Um, it's named after the land of youth. Oh. It is involved in proliferation and self-renewal. And so that means stemness. So it's a good marker for stemness. But you don't need it to turn something back to become pluripotent. 
uh, if you overexpress it in human embryonic stem cells, they will remain pluripotent, right? That's like what we set up here. If we knock out or knock down nanog, the differentiation goes up. So if you want your cells to differentiate, you want to turn off nanog. If you want to keep those cells in culture as pluripotent, then you want to keep nanog on. Yeah, but we don't need it to induce pluripotency, but it helps keep it pluripotent. Oh, cell lines, people. Human iPS cell lines, here's the big four. So we need to know those guys because they're going to come up. What else? We actually, so how do we get those stupid genes? How do we get those transcription factors to be expressed in a differentiated cell that doesn't express those? We don't actually have to open up that DNA and make their endogenous or the ones in their own chromosomes come on. That really doesn't work. We tried it. Uh, we add the DNA, the gene for each one of these proteins into a retrovirus, and then we infect those cells. Okay, viruses are super good at getting inside our cells. That's why viruses suck and they make us sick because they're really good at getting inside our cells. So we're using them to get those genes in there. Once those genes are in there, and retroviruses integrate into the DNA. So they integrate into the DNA, and then we do transcription and translation of the central dogma. <laughs> Just like we normally would with any old gene, they're on, we make a whole bunch of those transcription factors. Those guys then are the guys that open up the endogenous chromosomes, demethylate, help with the histone acetylation. They don't physically do the demethylation, but they recruit the guys that do all that stuff. And what you get is a bunch of iPS colonies. So on feeder layers, so you have to have cells there because they're making stuff that they're spewing out in their extracellular matrix. It kind of is like a little nursery for those guys. And then you pick individual colonies, like that'd be a colony and then you expand them. Each colony should be a clone, right? Should be clonal, should have come from one original cell. And then we can expand them. And if you're ordering them from somewhere, from a, um, a core facility, you'd get the original cells and then the iPS cells so you can compare and contrast and see, make sure they're actually pluripotent and embryonic. And so how do we know for sure? So there's a bunch of ways to tell if a cell is actually pluripotent. So the best way is to see if those cells, if, if this ball of cells, so this would be our ball of iPS cells that we just grew, that colony, and then we jam them into a blastocyst, right? Um, or, you know, like, like an empty blastocyst, get out that inner cell mass, put that in as its inner cell mass, and then can those guys become then a litter of... Um, little mousy guys. Okay, if they put some sort of reporter system or cell marker so we know they definitely came from the transplanted versus the anything that might have been original that was in there, then, you know, we get those guys. So the guys that look like mom are probably the ES cells that were already in there. Whatever we added extra is from the mousies that we, that we, that we took the skin made the induced pluripotent stem cells, jammed in the blastocyst, made that guy. This is super expensive and it takes a long time. Okay? By then you've been culturing your stupid iPS cells forever and they probably have differentiated by now so you can't do anything with them anyways. But if that's all you were trying to do is see if you could make iPSCs, then that's fine. What else? You can look at markers, right? So you look and see what they look like, what's their histology, stain them with all this stuff. So are they expressing nanog? Are they expressing CMIC? Are they expressing OCT4? Are they expressing SOX2? Are they expressing KLF4? Uh, are, is there methylation on the DNA? Do genome-wide screening for methylation? There should be much less methylation than a differentiated cell. And then, right, what genes are turned on? Uh, so usually they have to do this, right? Uh, and the... The standard of the field before you publish that you've made iPSC cells is to make a teratoma. 
Um, so in this case, you take those cells and you inject under the skin of nude mice. So nude mice are immunosuppressed, immunobad. <laughs> they have no immune system essentially, so they're not going to reject those cells because they're human, right? They'll end up allowing them to grow. And so then you should develop a tumor with structures from all three germ layers, right? If those cells are allowed to then just differentiate, they should randomly start differentiating into all three germ layers. Some cells are going to go ectoderm, mesoderm, um, endoderm. So I did a lot of looking to see if I could find <laughs> some pictures, and they were disgusting. So if you want to see something really gross, look up teratoma images because they're disgusting because they make all the tissue. So some have hair, some have teeth, some have nails. It's I couldn't find anything that was at all appropriate, so I decided to show some histology, which I don't expect you to be able to tell the difference between. I can't tell, only a pathologist can really tell. So um, if they're looking at the different teratomas, right, in each one of these are looking for endoderm, endodermal morphology or markers, ectodermal morphology or markers, and then mesoderm. I, I can't tell the difference, but pathologists do. And so if you're going to publish a paper that you made iPSC cells and then you did um, some experiments with them, they would be like, well, let me see your slides about the teratomas. So right, you guys can look up your own <laughs> nasty teratomas because they were disturbing or not. If you don't want to be disturbed, don't look them up. Okay. And then, of course, once you have them, if you want to differentiate them to use them for anything, I mean, if you want to just study the iPSCs, that's great. But if you want to study nerves or you want to try to do any kind of regenerative medicine and replace cells, then you're going to want to differentiate them, right? So here we go. Here's our fibroblasts. Here we give them these guys. Of course, this is an old slide, so they still include Nanog um, and Oct3 and Lin28. So we really don't need that. We don't need 3 and we don't need Nanog to reprogram, we get our IPS colonies, and then we pick those, and then we give them factors that we know will allow cardiomyocytes to grow, or adipocytes, or nerve, or motor neurons, or pancreatic beta cells, or whatever we want. Dang it. And so pretty much, you know, when this was set up, they can pretty much make everything. I, I'd have to look to see, or somebody can look up to see what are the cell types we can't differentiate into from IPS cells, because I don't know, but we can look it up. So what's the problem? Why aren't we curing everybody? Why hasn't this just been the most amazing thing ever? It is the most amazing thing ever, except that because we use viruses as carriers, and because we're adding transcription factors that cause tumor suppressor genes to go down, which causes mitosis to go up, this is a tumor suppressor gene. <laughs> and mitosis to go up, what if those guys keep working? What if we think we've differentiated? Or what if we're using the iPSCs and we want to put them somewhere and let them grow up? Well, don't make a teratoma. We've already shown that. That's the whole point. So how do we know we've gotten everything differentiated to a point where they're no longer going to make a teratoma if we put them in a person? Like, that would be super important. So the problem is mostly is cancer and tumors. So that is a big problem. Um, and we know CMYK is an oncogene, right? The most famous, the first recognized, the classic. Um, we also know that the iPSCs retain some methylation patterns. They don't look exactly like human embryonic stem cells. They're not exactly the same. So they're not gonna, if they don't have the exact same genotype and epigenotype, then they're not going to, then they can't work exactly the same. And so that's a little worrisome. Um, and genetic mutations occur in tons of the, the cell lines. So drug discovery, um, animal studies, but sticking them back into a human being, a little sketchy. All right. So even though they're sketchy, we're working on that. We're trying to figure out a way not to use viruses and make sure we can kick out any viral DNA, make sure we get those genes shut down when they're supposed to be. I'm not going to read this. This is a nice summary for you guys, so you can read on your own in case you, know, you don't want to go through this whole stupid lecture again. 
and me talking again. Um, more summaries, <laughs> right? Transplantation, uh, animal studies, right? We talked about all this stuff. But repair tissues, blah, blah, blah. All of that potential that uh, IPSCs can do because if they're personalized medicine, if, if I take a skin cell, make an embryonic stem cell, and grow myself some kidney, and I get a transplant, I'm not going to reject my immune system. I'm not going to reject it. It's me. I might reject if it was made from an embryonic stem cell from somebody else, right? It wouldn't be from me because all of mine are me. And, and we know kidney transplants from other individuals, like adults, right? Not so great. You have to be on immunosuppressive drugs, blah, blah, blah. So the power of the IPSC is amazing. You just got to get to the safety. And then just some articles that are uh, famous, right? Some of the first ones, again, this epigenetic memory, right? They still have some of the methylation patterns of their differentiated original guy. And copy number variation and selection. So copy number genes, uh, chromosomes. Ah, you can get the chromosomes totally messed up in some of these. And so then you're not going to stick that in a person. What else? Uh, coding mutations. Right, so that's mutations in a gene that causes a coding problem. So changed amino acid, like making mutant proteins, not good. Don't want to stick that in the person. And aberrant epigenomic reprogramming again. So certain areas that really just don't get rid of that profile, and that's not so good because then they're not going to act like a real stem cell, and then that could potentially cause trouble. So thank you so much for, for watching. It was so much nicer to stand up and jump around and talk to you guys. Um, oh, what was that? Oh, so I hope you enjoyed this show and I will see you soon. Now I have to figure out, I always have this problem um, with how, oh, there it is, and how to turn us off. So I'm going to stop recording and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching.